Hello there, your boy with the blaze here from the future. Just wanted to jump in and say that if you're watching this channel and thinking, oh boy, Simon doesn't make enough content for me, well, good news, I've got a new channel. I originally had another channel called Mega Projects, which was all about mega projects, and some of the stuff that I wanted to cover on that channel wasn't quite mega enough. So I was like, you know what we'll do? We'll make a new channel called Side Projects, which is available now. It covers all sorts of things. Soviet space weapons, World War II's greatest airplanes, histories, lost treasures, and the movement of London Bridge from London to a random town in America, which sounds almost like it could be a business blaze, but it's over on Side Projects. There is a link below. Please go over and subscribe, because why not? And if you don't like it, that's fine. Go over and smash the dislike button, and let's get into it. I'm disgusted by you, but I hope my God forgives you. Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Business Blaze. This one is a little bit experimental, and whenever I try to do something experimental, you guys are like, read the facts, fact boy. Make the funny dance, monkey boy. Uh, but what's going on here? This is actually, I believe it was a viewer suggestion or someone emailed me or something like that, and was like, have Danny write a script, have several entries, have him make up some, and have the others be real, and then afterwards, uh, the answers will be revealed. So the way this is gonna work is I have got these answers, and I was like blurring my eyes while I folded them up, so I don't know the answers either. I believe there are five entries, and they're all folded up here, so the first one is, here, we're all gonna play this together. So I'm gonna read the first entry. I imagine there's an introduction. Oh, there's an extensive introduction because welcome to Business Place. So I assume all of this explaining is actually gonna be explained by Danny. Let's do it. It's called Fake or Real. <sighs> oh my God, I must be, I, I, I need to get, <laughs> I need to do some exercise. I got out of breath doing the monkey boy dance. Here we go. The other day I popped into my local cafe, or as we sometimes say in Britain, Calf, the Hungry Hippo. Danny, is your local <laughs> cafe really called the Hungry Hippo? For a quick socially distanced lunchtime coffee. It was an excellent coffee too. I spent a good 10 minutes enjoying the every sip. It was just a shame that I had to spend about two hours fiddling around with my dodgy Chinese phone to get the app working so that I could order it from a healthy social distance. And on that Chinese phone, Danny's running Android. Oh my God, Android Apple thing. Someone commented on a video that it's like, Simon, you obviously do care. <laughs> like, I don't, I really don't. I've had both. I don't care. During that time, a mysterious figure sat several meters away from me. I'm already not sure, is, is Danny's story fake or real? I'm guessing fake. Hungry Hippo is an unrealistic name. If my phone was closer, I'd Google map that shit. Although Danny's giving away his location, watch out Danny, the weirdos are gonna come. He sat several meters away from the table, snapping his fingers at me to get my attention. He only seemed to be able to keep this up for a few seconds before he felt the need to return both of his trembling hands to his glass of water. Although he seemed a bit of an odd bloke, he turned out to be a keen viewer of Business Blaze. Oh, it's fake. Not that many people watch Business Blaze. He said, he had watched all the videos in chronological order since the very first one, and his favorite video was all of them. I take back what I said, he is not odd, he is the ultimate legend. Then he started talking about a great idea he'd cooked up for a future video. What if I was to write a script which covered five or six slightly ridiculous business stories, but not all of them were true? And Simon had to figure out which stories were genuine, and you guys play along at home, and which ones were fake news. Simon wouldn't even know how many meant were meant to be true or false. Oh, I don't. I don't. They could all be true. They could all be false. The possibilities. This would make the game even more difficult. I actually thought this sounded like a pretty good idea, and the mysterious bloke was becoming more and more excited about it. I'm not sure if this guy came up with. I don't even remember where I got this idea. Maybe Danny even suggested this idea, and this is actually true. It came from somewhere. I, my life is just going from one thing to another like a crazy person, so I do forget all of this stuff. I, he thought it was a perfect idea. A tremendous idea. Probably the best idea that anybody in the universe has ever come up with. Sounds like a fellow we know. <laughs> Uh, it was at this point that I realized that the mysterious figure was Donald Trump. Oh, there we go. <laughs> it's like, just after a, uh, it took him five minutes, I was like, oh, aren't you arguably the most famous person in the world? And it was shortly afterwards that I remembered that I didn't live anywhere near a cafe called The Hungry Hippo. As the walls of the cafe began to slowly melt away into puddles of rainbows, I reminded myself that I really should avoid eating those moldy mushrooms that I keep finding down here in the basement. Oh no, Danny, we talked about this! <laughs> of course. None of this absurd story is remotely true. I've never spent more than an hour and 40 minutes trying to order a socially distanced coffee from my phone. And fake or real ideas popped up in the comments from Business Blaze viewer, Ben Stanfield. Oh, Danny, you're a better man than me. And Ben, you are welcome, Ben Stanfield. Of course, it can be quite difficult to fool Simon, bearing in mind that he's probably made a video about everything that's ever happened ever, So it's, but it's worth a shot. 
Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. I like that I don't know these either. It actually makes it fun for me, whereas normally these are a f***ing nightmare. Not really. It's a laugh. Let's go. Reddit was built on a lie. Don't spoil it in the comments, by the way. If I see people spoiling it again, loads of upvotes, I'll f***ing delete that sh <laughs> Before moving on to the main point of this opening story, I want to kick off with a personal memory that is unequivocally true. I'm just not entirely sure if I should be admitting it. Years and years ago, I picked up a peculiar job for a new global social media platform, which was apparently going to take over the internet. I don't think that I should reveal the details or nature of the platform, as I might get into trouble. <laughs> a friend of mine, uh, not a friend of mine, my cousin, had a really weird job. He wrote, he was like a writer, and he wrote the descriptions that you read on porn websites. That was his job. So just watching porn and having to write descriptions for websites. <laughs> but the problem was the platform was so new that nobody had joined up yet. It's one of these platforms where it's like it's going to be the next Facebook. It's like, and whenever someone says that, I'm like, it's not, is it though? It's not. Statistically, it's not. And, and frankly, you're not talented enough. And the owners of the platform wanted to give the illusion that it was already quite popular. So they employed me to set up hundreds of bogus accounts on the platform. Sounds like a recipe for success. And then use these to create hundreds and hundreds of conversations between the accounts which could be viewed by any new visitor. So I was essentially being paid to talk to myself how little things change. Danny, you should be happy. I gave you Sam. Allegedly. I'm pretty sure it wasn't breaking any laws. It's maybe just cheating a little bit. I don't think that the platform ever took over the internet. But I was surprised to discover that Reddit was built on, similar, on a similar foundation of lies and deception. The American social news aggregator website may now be considered the front page of the internet, a revolutionary powerhouse, and the internet's biggest influential tastemaker. But back in 2005, when it first launched, the site was understandably very quiet. And I will just point out just in case this is completely made up this is all part of a game reddit lawyers please don't sue me i mean if in turn if it turns out we're making this up because it shall be revealed it's a game relax when it first launched it was understandably quiet so the co-founders roommate steve huffman and alexis uh 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 a Hanian decided to spice things up a bit by generating tons and tons of submissions from completely fake accounts. I'm gonna say this is real. I feel like I don't I don't know this, but I have an inkling that I've read about this somewhere or heard about this from something, and it also sounds entirely believable and honestly like quite a good idea. Because it's not like they're faking social interactions, they're posting things that people would find interesting. You know, it's Reddit, that's you know, someone has to kick it off. Reddit quickly became crammed with content, but it was all from the same small team who actually worked for Reddit, as well as providing the mirage of popularity, this also helped the team shape and define the tone and direction of the website. And although it could be argued that the first few months of Reddit were more or less a complete fictional sham, the strategy worked. Yeah, it did. Because you've heard of Reddit and you're probably addicted to it. The team was eventually in a position... I, I used to be addicted to Reddit like no end. Like, I was like, oh my god, there's so much good stuff on here. I can never leave. And then I had to get one of those Chrome extensions that blocks me from accessing Reddit because it's too good. It's, I don't even know why you're watching this business place right now. Just go use Reddit. It's better. The team was eventually in a position to let go of the fake accounts when they'd got enough real people to seemingly to the seemingly lively surface. Service. Today, there are approximately 330 million Reddit users, generating over a billion monthly page views. Good lord. But this revelation about the origins of Reddit is unlikely to go down well with the, is it only a billion monthly page views on Reddit? That actually doesn't seem that high. But this revelation about the origins of Reddit is unlikely to go down well with all the users who have found themselves getting permanently booted off the platform for pulling the exact same stunt with the fake, with fake accounts. So much for practicing what gets preached in the Reddit terms and conditions, the site was born from breaching its own rules. Yeah, but they probably wrote those rules later, didn't they, Danny? It's not like they started out writing rules like no fake accounts and then just made loads of fake accounts. They probably added the fake accounts thing later. Also, isn't half of Reddit fake accounts where people post things that they don't want their real name attached to because they're too embarrassing? Or here's another mind-bending thought. Maybe Reddit is still playing the long game and you're the only real person on there. That's a Reddit have a huge team then. Uh, I'm gonna say this is absolutely 100% true and uh, I don't know how to play along at home, but you know, maybe come to your answer right now because the answer is. Did Reddit cheat with tons of fake accounts to kickstart their own company? Real! Reddit co-founder Steve Huffman was happy to publicly admit the slightly dodgy origins of video of Reddit. I'm going to fold that over a little bit because the last line's not there. In a video produced for Udacity, an online source 
for education and lectures. Okay, one for one, Danny. Challenge me, Danny. A uh, meteor fizz gets lost in space. Okay. This was a bit before my time, but during the 1970s, all the cool kids in UK playgrounds were drinking thrillingly themed cans of pot produced by a fairly small Scottish soft drinks manufacturer called Pabri and Hines. Oh god, I've never heard of any of this stuff. Some of them were backed with compelling TV commercials, and the biggest seller of all was Meteor Fizz. I'm not entirely sure what it was meant to taste like, as the marketing campaign just banged on about how it was the thrilling taste of the future. My guess, I've never heard of any of this. Like, I feel like the last one I was like, I've heard of this. So either, so I think it's real. Whereas this one I've never heard of. So let's see how we do. My guess was that it was a bit fruity, maybe with a dash of lime. That's what the future tastes like, I guess, Danny. <laughs> Me, it probably tastes like processed grasshoppers or whatever, you know, that few food that we have to eat in the future when the world's been destroyed and we can no longer eat delicious animals and we have to eat like the less delicious ones and insects. The, but sadly, the problem for Padbury and Heinz is that the 1980s came along. While their marketing stayed very much rooted in the 1970s, the ads began to look dated and cheesy and embarrassing. And the cool kids turned to Umbungo instead. That's real, I've heard of that. Most of the company's drinks disappeared from the shops completely and Padbury and Hines looked as dead and buried as an ET cartridge for the Atari 2600. OG business plays legend joke right there. Uh, but then the much bigger Scottish soft drinks company, Bar, heard of them, came along and acquired Padbury and Hines for £150,000. Bar, a most famous drink, I was just gonna say, they make this weird Scottish drink called Iron Brew, which tastes so weird. But Scottish people, they like it more than life itself. It's quite strange. Damn Scots! They ruined Scotland! Uh, which is probably not widely known outside of the UK, but the best way of describing it is orange, fizzy, cheap, and a bit like liquid bubblegum. Yeah, it's a bit weird. After whiskey, it's probably the second national drink of Scotland. Yeah, it's mad popular in Scotland. £150,000. I had a coffee. Oh, did I leave my coffee in the coffee machine? I'll be right back. Ding, ding! Problem solved. Oh, it's a little bit cold now, unfortunately. £150,000 might sound like a lot to fork out for a practically dead company with barely any products in store, but considering that Padbury and Hines had produced a whole whole range of memorable and instantly recognizable brands in their 70s heyday, it was actually a staggeringly good idea. And Bar had set aside an additional £750,000 to relaunch the good, good YouTube in there, Simon. Take a sip of your coffee in the middle of a sentence. You legend. Relaunch the product that interested them the most. They wanted to bring Meteor Fizz into the 1980s with a new slick advertising campaign that would reignite interest in the contemporary school playgrounds. The money was spent the new commercials were produced, and the cans were ready to hit the shops again. Then Barr encountered a slight snag. I'm getting the feeling this is fake. There's too much backstory. I feel like whenever there's too much backstory, it's like, it feels wrong. But then it could be completely true, so who knows? People are, British people are probably saying, Oh, I can't, I can't believe you've never heard of Meteor Fizz, Simon. <laughs> are you even British? Are you even British? During the acquisition, it seems that nobody had bothered to ask whether Padbury and Heinz had still, ha still held the registered trademark to the Meteor Fizz drink. That seems like an error. <laughs> Someone's lawyers are gonna get sued. And unfortunately, it turns out that the trademark had long since lapsed and had been bought for practically peanuts by a very small private company who are now taking issue with Barr over the proposed relaunch of Meteor your fizz. I also, I, I think this is indicating me towards fake because as we've talked about extensively on this channel, like my desire to purchase the, the defunct Theranos trademark and rename this channel Business Blaze brought to you by Theranos. And I think this has maybe laid the seed of an idea in Danny's mind and now he is presenting it as one of the false stories. Mm. But it could be real. And then I'll be like, wow, yeah, I was wrong. It also does feel a bit obscure, doesn't it? So it could be real because it's just so obscure. And unfortunately it turns out uh, it had been bought by this private company, which was now taking issue with Bar over the relaunch of Meteor Fizz. The good news is that the new trademark holders were quite happy to sell it to Bar, as they didn't appear to be doing anything productive with it anyway. The bad news is they wanted 1.2 million pounds for it, and they weren't prepared to budge an inch. They knew that they pretty much had Bar over a barrel of fizzy pop. Bar ended up paying more for the trademark rights to Meteor Fizz than they had paid for the acquisition of the whole company and the massive marketing campaign combined. I think, one, it's unrealistic they paid ten times as much. Two, lawyers don't fuck up that bad. Three, the seed of thing of an idea for Danny. I think this is fake. I'm, I'm like 70% sure this is fake. It seems as if they just about clawed the money back with prom with the promising early sales of new Meteor Fizz, so it wasn't a total disaster. But considering that the drink of the future had disappeared from stores again within 12 months, they probably now wish they had a bothered. And why did it disappear? Why would it disappear if the early sales were good? I think this is so fake. Did Bar ends up getting screwed with the registered trademark for Meteor Fizz? Vote now, people at home. It's fake. Mwah, two for two. Challenge me, Danny. There was no such drink as Meteor Fizz, but if there had been, I like to imagine it would have tasted exactly like the future. No one knows what the future tastes like, Danny, except for me. Tastes like processed grasshoppers. Tastes like shit. 
What'd you do? Take a dump in it? Uh, ticket to heaven. One of the trickier hurdles to overcome. I'm enjoying this, by the way. I'm having a great time. People are gonna be like, Simon, just do the regular business, please. It's much more fun, and we don't like your fake shit. And I'll be like, whatever. <laughs> I'm having a good time. You're probably still gonna watch. Smash that dislike button. Ooh. Look very appropriately today. Smash the dislike button. You can buy this and you can support the show. The show doesn't need support. I make enough money. Uh, at PurchaseTheMerch.co. Buy the shirt if you like it. I've said this before and I'll say it again. Don't buy the shirt to support the show. Buy the shirt because you like it. I don't want anyone being like, Simon, I bought the shirt to support you. Don't waste your money on that. I don't need your money. But if you like the shirt, this is how business works. This, I really feel like, look, I'll make some good shirts. If you like them, you can buy them. We don't need all this bullshit around it. One of the trickier hurdles to overcome in ensuring that you spend the rest of eternity in the kingdom of heaven. I don't know why I sang that. Where there's a free Free bar in every pub and your garbage gets collected twice a week without fail. Wait, my garbage gets collected twice a week without fail? <laughs> I mean, I think. I just put it in the big communal bins and they're never full, so I don't I don't really worry about it. First of all, problems is that in the Christian religion, at least, you'll first need to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Ah, oh, I'm fucked then, aren't I? I accept the spaghetti monster. Uh, but what if you could get a shortcut past the pearly gates? Ooh, now I'm interested. I mean, honestly, if I die and it turns out Jesus and all that is real, I'll be like, oh, it's real, sorry. Yeah, you were right. And they'll be like, welcome to heaven. And if they send me to, I, I don't know why I'm even speculating on this because it's clearly all bull <laughs> Brother, I deliver good news. Ooh. In much the same way that you can buy fast track tickets at theme parks to bypass the queues of peasants, you can now buy a ticket to heaven without having to stop at the gates and be judged by St. Peter. I heard that you can go to Disney and you can get someone for like $500 an hour to take you around the park and just put you in the front of every queue and tell you which rides are best. And I'm like, that is cool. As you can now buy a ticket to heaven without having to stop at the gates and be judged by St. Peter, all you need to do is spend somewhere between $12 and $16 at the website, reserve a spot in heaven. This is so absurd, I think it's true. Of course, it's not hard to believe that anybody would make such a ridiculous website. And it's not so many miles away from the idea that getting a star named after yourself or flogging a plot of land on the moon. Yeah, both of those things are fake, don't fall for them. But it really did become a genuinely successful business venture with thousands of thousands of playing customers. The cheap essential kit, provides you with a first-class ticket to heaven, a heavenly-issued certificate of reservation with a unique ID number, an official heaven identification kit, and a mini-information guide. For a few extra dollars, you can also grab an all-access VIP pass, which grants access into the most exclusive zones of heaven, like the land of milk and honey. Whoever made this, if it's real, you're going to hell. <laughs> but I'm going to bet that the person who made this doesn't believe in any of that malarkey. Smash that dislike button. The best bit is that if you don't get into heaven after purchasing the kit and eventually dropping dead, the website guarantees a complete 100% refund. You can't say fairer than that. People often be like, Simon, why do you just make fun of Christianity? It's like, no, no, no. I, I think all religions are ridiculous and I'll make fun of all of them, except for that one that they might kill me if I make fun of it because I don't want to be killed. <laughs> um, freedom of speech. Yeah, I don't want to die, okay? I just don't want to die. I just don't want to. I haven't reserved my spot in heaven. Uh, the reserve a spot in heaven has attracted a lot of criticism. One outraged Christian declared that you are making a mockery of the salvation only God can guarantee us. I'm absolutely disgusted with your immoral conduct, uh, conduct and hope God will have mercy on your soul. Well, that's very nice. It's like, I'm disgusted by you, but I hope my God forgives you. The Seattle-based company reports that approximately one in every 10 emails is an abusive complaint from a Bible basher. <laughs> <laughs> I hope they wrote it like that. Uh, but the website was doing pretty good business for a while, racking up around $12,000 worth of sale, sales in the first two months alone. It's pretty impressive. Sadly, the website now seems to have disappeared into another realm, and it's no longer possible to reserve your one-way ticket to paradise for $12. Perhaps heaven just got full after this unexpected surge in new residents. Ah, uh, this is true. This is so true. I'm 80% sure. I'm more sure about this one, which I've never heard of, than the first one, which I've sort of, sort of heard of. Am I about to embarrass my Myself. Was Reserve a Spot in Heaven a thriving online business venture? Cast your votes. Real? That's right. It's possible that most. This is so fun. I'm having such a good time. Uh, it's possible that most of the customers were buying the kits as gag gifts, but it's reported that many of the purchases were made by lost souls who felt they really were buying a valid ticket to heaven. And quite bizarrely, many of them took the time to question the mechanics of the refund policy. Mmm, challenge me, Danny! Next up, paper droppings. Pigeon droppings, sorry. Uh, no idea what this could be about, but Nikola Tesla loved him some pigeons in some really weird ways. I made a podcast about that. I started a podcast called the Simon Whistler Podcast, and I don't know, it just wasn't very good, so I stopped doing it. People are like, where's the podcast? And I'm like, I try a lot of shit that doesn't work. 
Like, uh, the, only the successful channels remain. There have been channels and ideas and things that I've tried that have just faded away because they sucked. If you're planning to release a new tennis game for consoles, it would be quite a smart idea to time the release around the most important event in the tennis calendar, Wimbledon. Now, the French, the Australians, and the Americans might beg to differ with you on that one, Danny, although I completely agree, Wimbledon is obviously the most important championship. And that's exactly why American software, we're talking about too much sport, and it's even the sport I like. And that's exactly what American software label Acclaim did when they launched Virtua Tennis 2 for the PlayStation 2 and Dreamcast in 2002. The next logical step would be to thrash out some kind of PlayStation 2 in 2002. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. The next logical step would have been to thrash out some kind of sponsorship deal with the tournament or one of its star players, but that wouldn't have come cheap. So Acclaim came up with a cheaper alternative to take the game to the courts of Wimbledon and into the faces of potential customers. They branded 20 pigeons with the Virtual Tennis 2 logo and trained them all to invade the tennis courts and proudly flap the logo in the faces of several members of the crowd before heading back home to a secret location in the southwest of London. Nah, this sounds fake. The media were invited to observe the pigeon training sessions for themselves and Acclaim was keen to point out that their marketing campaign would not directly interfere with the prestigious competition, as the pigeons would only be released during pre-match warm-ups. Wait, so they announced this was going to happen? This sounds like bullshit. The company also stressed that no harm would come to the birds, as they would simply be coated in a water-based paint. So they were painted with this, like, logo? You can't be- No one's painting pigeons. This is fake. This is definitely fake. Although it's so absurd that it could be real. But the Lawn Tennis Association, the national governing body of the sport in the UK, may have put a spanner in the works over the alleged safety of the pigeons. Fearing a disruption of the event along with the risk of paying members of the audience finding pigeon shit in their strawberries and ice cream, the Lawn Tennis Association are reported to have invested in a pack of hawks that would be trained to identify and kill any promotional pigeon getting in on the game. No, they wouldn't. They'd just get a court order to stop a claim doing this. It's fake. A claim grew concerned that their branded pigeons getting mauled to death live on television might not send out positive vibes about their new game. This wouldn't send out positive vibes anyway. People watching Wimbledon don't want to see pigeons flying around the court, and they're not going to buy your game. Uh, so they were forced to drop the whole idea at the very last minute. So the world never got to see Acclaim's flying billbirds in action, but we came very close. And it may not have mattered much, as they still generated plenty of media coverage and sales from the aborted plan anyway, even though the game was reportedly absolute pants. It's fake! But it's so absurd that it could be real! Uh, what number is this? We just did heaven. I think it's fake. It's so fake. It's so fake. Cast your votes. Real! No! You can't be serious! No one's painting f***ing pigeons! Acclaim has a long history of coming up with wacky promotional ideas that never quite take flight, but the flying billbirds was it weird even by their standards. That's nuts! So they were really gonna paint pigeons. That doesn't- Well, you just gotta hold that f***ing rub and be like, Mm, yeah, just get that virtual tenor logo in there. What the f to uh, acclaim? Well, that's incredible. Danny, you got me. I like it. Next. I think this is the last. Is this the last one? Oh, no, there's another one. There's another one. Excellent. Acres Dust Up. The small town of Ludlow in Shropshire, England, was home to one of the fiercest business rivalries of the 20th century. And right in the heart of this war were toasted muffins and apple strudels. I do love some toasted muffins and apple strudels. That all sounds delicious. The Little Ludlow Pantry had first opened its doors in 1953, while Bramley Bramble's Bakery opened a little while later in 1958 and was situated just a couple of streets away. For the first few decades, both of the small independent bakeries seemed quite happy to coexist alongside each other and enjoyed a fairly friendly rivalry. But during the 1980s, the original owners of both bakeries and handed in their baking empire and handed their baking empires over to their respective sons, and this was when the shit really hit the fan. I love that expression. Peter Bramble became the new owner of Bramble's Bakery, and one of his new marketing strategies was to start slagging off his competition. Oh no, Peter, don't do that. It's like a low blow. It's like the politicians where they're like, yeah, he's a dickhead. And it's like, can't you just to say something good about yourself rather than saying something bad about the other people? Or like, I mean, come on. There was, I'm recording this, and there was that uh, Trump-Biden debate yesterday. And it's just like, you're both terrible. Ah, oh, it's uncomfortable. You're adult men. Roger Frey, the inventor of the Little Ludlow Pantry, took this up a notch when he started putting up his own window signs, which read, Bramble's Bakery, a filthy lie crooks. Get the real deal at the only genuine bakery in town. What's a fake bakery? It's like, nah, he just buys all the shit from Tesco and puts it in his shop. But the, fe the feud intensified over the next few years, as customers found themselves getting banned for life if they were ever spotted in the rival bakery. Well, that's a good way to get rid of your customers forever, isn't it? Just be like, hey, actually, you went to the other bakery, I've got a better deal for you. I'll give you a little discount. I'll give you a little bit of free muffin on the side. Mmm, free muffin. Who doesn't love that? But things reached 
baking temperature. In 90s, I did that one silent. Why not? I like to mix it up. Smash that dislike button. But things really reached baking temperature on the 24th of June, 1995, when Roger Frey, the owner of the Little Ludlow Pantry, was wandering by his arch rival's shop one morning and peered through the windows to find that one of his own most loyal customers, an elderly lady called Rita Pollard, was at the counter buying a vanilla slice. Roger stormed inside the bakery and began ranting and raving at Miss Pollard, who had once claimed to him that she had never been inside Bramble's Bakery in her whole life. Ah, oh, Mrs. Pollard, you Traitor! Or maybe she just really wanted a vanilla slice. Calm down, Peter, for fuck's sake. Or Roger, whoever this is. No one cares. No one cares. If this is fake, it's... it's. I, I believe this. I mean, I've never heard of it. It doesn't seem important at all. It seems like two small town bakers like fighting against each other. It's a nice story, but... Uh, Pete Bramble was behind the counter at the time, and he seemed to find the situation quite amusing. He added fuel to the flames by casually informing Roger that Mrs. Pollard was one of his best customers, and she came in every day to buy the expensive stuff for herself, then popped into the little Ludlow pantry to buy cheap crap for her dog. Oh, Peter, Peter, Peter. You guys. He was probably less amused when Roger responded by having a complete meltdown and started smashing the shop to bits. Holy shit. He just goes absolutely fucking nuts. I really hope this is true. I'm just, I'm gonna vote for this one to be true because I love it. With the help of a couple of customers, Peter eventually managed to manhandle Roger out of the bakery, throwing him out onto the pavement and warning him never to step inside the little Ludlow pantry ever again. If someone smashed my shop to bits, I'd be like, mate, you're paying for that. The police are coming. I'll Karen the shit out of you. But Roger came back the very same night under the veil of darkness when the bakery was closed and he brought with him a tub of gasoline. Oh no! Bramble's bakery was burned to the ground that night and sadly it also took down a neighboring pharmacy in the flames of Roger Frey's anger. Roger, you're going to prison, mate. I'm sorry. On that very same night, Mrs. Pollard got a brick through the front window of her home and a little note attached to it which simply read, nobody likes a liar. <laughs> Mrs. Pollard's like, oh my god, oh no. <laughs> I just imagine this super old, like, codgery British lady, like, Argh. Surprisingly, Roger Frey was never charged with the latter incident and claims that the brick through the window was a stitch-up. Maybe it was. <laughs> yeah, maybe it was. I didn't even read that and Danny comes up with the same thing. I'd like to think Roger would at least have the decency to attach one last fudge cookie around the brick. He also claimed that the burning down of Bramble's Bakery was a stitch up too, but he didn't get away with that. Roger served six years in prison for arson. During that time, his own business closed down and the Bramble Bakery never bothered to reopen again. And now Mrs. Pollard's not gonna be able to get anything anywhere. The poor dear. <laughs> but the good news, Mrs. Pollard, oh good. And the rest of Ludlow's that a brand new bakery opened shortly afterwards and is still going strong today. Let's just hope nobody has the bright idea of opening up another one anytime soon. It seems that there really is only room for one bakery in this wild, wild town. I'm gonna say this is real. Because it feels like something Danny would like read about in like a local paper and really enjoy and remember and then look up. And I also want it to be real. Oh, it's fake! Ah, oh, Danny, you got me again! But you can get a nice almond croissant from the Ludlow Bakery for just £1.85. It's a pretty good deal. Well done, Danny. I asked you to challenge me. And you did. $67 million pants. It's going to be a bit of a struggle for me in this last story to repeatedly use the word pants when I know in my heart that I should be using the word trousers, which is far more sensible. Yes, in, in Britain, uh, these are trousers and what I'm wearing underneath them are my boxer shorts, also known as my pants. Bearing in mind that Sony Business Blaze viewers are from the United States, I'll try my best to stick with pants. You're welcome, Americans, you're welcome. And all the British people stop pandering to the American, Simon. Chill the f out. Look, look, there should be more of you. There should be more, there's 300 million of them. There's like 70 million, million British people. Their number is like four to one. Over the years, America has seen more than enough lawsuits which could best be described as frivolous. But perhaps the one that really takes the biscuit is the story of a judge who once claimed that his local dry cleaners had given the wrong pair of pants and subsequently filed a lawsuit for $67 million. Oh, I have to declare a conflict. Oh, I've just given it away, haven't I? I'm pretty sure I've heard of this. Pretty sure I've heard of this. This is a problem with the game when I've heard of it. I'm just giving it away like a dickhead. <laughs> Especially when I was like, don't spoil it in the comments below. And here I am being a complete knobbo. Okay, the nightmare began in 2005 when an administrative law judge in Washington, D.C. called Roy L. Pearson Jr. popped into his local dry cleaners, which was run by a South Korean immigrant family called the Chungs. Piers dropped off the pair of pants, quite a flashy and distinctive pair, with a trio of belt loops on both sides and the front waistband. This is remarkably specific, and then returns later to pick them up. Unfortunately, there was a slight delay in getting them back, as the Chungs had mistakenly sent them off to another dry cleaners that they owned. 
But when the Pearson family got them back, he claimed they'd been given the wrong pants and demanded $1,000 in compensation. Understandably, the Chungs declined the generous offer and insisted that he be given the right pants back right away. Yeah, it's like, dude, for what? $1,000? You can f right off, mate. So Pearson took the only course of action he felt available to him. He filed a lawsuit in the District of Columbia Superior Court for $67 million. Dude, are you smoking? Are you a judge? You're a judge. What are you smoking, son? Is it crack? Now, that might sound a bit steep, but let's be reasonable here. I'm really wanting to see how this gets there, Danny. His claim included $500,000 for attorney's fees, $2 million for discomfort and inconvenience, uh, inconvenience and mental distress, $15,000 to cover the costs of renting a car every weekend to drive to the near, near, next nearest dry cleaning service. What is going on? Perhaps the most bizarre part of this story is that the Trunks ended up offering a fairly substantial settlement to end this miserable episode, which had made them consider moving back to South Korea, where, where you don't get any of this kind of crazy shit. I'd be like, what the f is going on? This is insane. <laughs> there was an outpouring of public support for the Chungs, and a dedicated website had managed to raise a pot of money dedicated to helping support their legal defense. At one point, the Chungs offered a $12,000 settlement for the missing pants. What is going on? Uh, which doesn't sound like a bad deal at all for Pearson. But Judge Fancy Pants was sticking to his guns. What a cock, allegedly. The best was that the best he was willing to offer was a slight reduction to $54 million. Where are they going to get $54 million, Judge? During the course of the trial, Pearson at one point broke down in tears over the frustration of losing his favorite pants, and a short recess had to be declared. Thankfully, the courts ultimately ruled in favor of the Chungs, who had the right to try and recover $83,000 from Pearson to cover their own legal fees. Good lord. But as they had already managed to raise over $100,000 from supporters, the Chungs decided not to pursue the motion in the hopes that Pearson would now drop the whole thing, move on, and not appeal the court's decision. Pearson appealed the court's decision. Oh my god, dude. Why is it? You're a judge. Are you smoking crack? Exactly. Yes, I have some looked crack cocaine. He lost that too, and at one point considered taking the case to the US Supreme Court, but he decided against that in the end. Finally, you're turning out to be smart. Can you imagine you go to the Supreme Court with that and they'll be like, listen, judge, we're taking away your judgeship. Because you're dumb. You're so dumb. Allegedly. Maybe a friend is probably going to sue me for $67 million. Allegedly. Maybe a friend with an ounce of sanity had a little word in his ear. Although he wasn't directly fired from his job, Pearson's initial two-year term as administrative law judge expired in 2007, and a panel decided against offering him. <laughs> Oh no, they did take away his job! I decided against offering a further 10 year term on the grounds that his lawsuits had demonstrated a lack of ju judicial temperament. Pearson's response to this was to file a lawsuit against Washington, D.C. This has to be real because it's so absurd. And I feel like I've definitely heard of it. Uh, for wrongful dismissal, but he lost that too. The weirdest thing of all this is the pants returned to Pearson by the trunks did have those very distinctive belt loops, but most people agree that he'd been given back the right pants all along. It's gotta be real. 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 It's real! The great American pants suit went down in history as one of the most blatantly frivolous lawsuits of all time. Guys, if you didn't like this, smash that dislike button. You are more than welcome to do that. This felt really long, but I had a great time. Thank you for watching. Uh, Perch the merch docker if you'd like to buy the smash the dislike. There's also tons of other shit that I got here. There's the uh, allegedly shirt. You can also pick that up. Oh, it just says legend, but it does say allegedly. Uh, what else have we got here? Oh yeah, the boy with the blaze. And all of this stuff is not just available in t-shirts, hoodies, etc. Also available. Thank you for watching. Wah! <laughs> <laughs>